Well, then we will have our call to worship. Please stand. We remember on this day the baptism of our Lord. It marked the place of his turning to save the world. We remember the coming of the Spirit upon him to prepare him for the work of Messiah. In the power of that Spirit, he healed and forgave. Under the guidance of that Spirit, he taught such wisdom. We thank you for our baptism. You met us with forgiveness. You met us with your spirit to empower us for life. We give you thanks for that place of meeting your grace. Amen. Do we do the hymn is number two hundred and two? As with gladness men of old. Two oh two. First verse. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please be seated. Almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this new year, defend us with your mighty power and grant that this year we resolve to more deeply seek your will for our lives. For your glory and that of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Red Hymnal 172. One, joy to the world. Yes. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. 
boy. Wild fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, for as the curse is found, for as the curse is found, we ask for us, the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness. And wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders of his love. Please join me in our confession. Most merciful God, we confess we have sinned against you. We have not loved you with our heart, soul, strength, and mind. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. Grant us renewed strength to walk the way of Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may live to the glory of your name. To Jesus we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Our Psalm is 29. Ascribe to the Lord your gods. You gods, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Subscribe to the Lord glory to God's name. Worship to the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The day of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The Lord makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Mount Hermon like a wild ox. The voice of the Lord burst forth in lightning flashes. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees writhe and strips the forest bare. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. O Lord, give strength to your people. Give them, O Lord, the blessings of peace. Our epistle is from Acts 8. 
Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. All right. Do you want me in the hallelujahs? Please, please stand. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Our gospel is from Luke. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the throng of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire now when all the people were baptized and when jesus also had been baptized and was praying the heavens was opened and the holy spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven you are my son the beloved with you, I am well pleased. That's the word of God. Please join me in the Alleluia. 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 Please be seated. You know, if you've ever been involved in planning a wedding, uh, I imagine every one of you uh, who have gone through that uh, have many good stories that you could share. Uh, a lot of things. So many details involved with an average size wedding that the prospective bride and groom tend to get stressed out weeks in advance. Just in general, I ran across a story featuring a young woman by the name of Cassandra Warren who became rattled and at least one invitation to her wedding was sent to a wrong address. The wedding had a Star Wars theme. <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, I won't even go there. Uh, and she was all excited about it, I, I hope. Fortunate, only one an invitation went astray. And as luck would have it, a week later, the invitation came back in return mail. The mistaken invitee had included a $20 bill in the envelope and had scribbled a note, message in it. I wish I knew you. Sounds like it will be a blast. Congratulations. Take the 20 and have dinner on me. Uh, must be McDonald's. I, I've been married for 40 years, and it gets better with age. Uh, of course, that 20 may reflect the last time he took his wife out, but be that as me. <laughs> and the bride sent back a gracious thank you, saying, I am thankful for people like you still being in the world, which I thought was a great response. The passage in Luke is that, in a sense, John in his preaching in the wilderness, is issuing God's invitation to the great wedding feast of the Lamb. This was a constant image in the Old Testament brought across into the New, that the great final day will be like a wedding feast, a time of joy and a time of, of great, you know, just overwhelming celebration. And uh, he, re he refers to it, of course, as the kingdom of God. 
and he invites the people to come. And uh, unlike uh, most weddings, he says there's some requirements here, y'all. Uh, you have to repent. You have to confess your sins to God. You have to be baptized so that you might receive the forgiveness of sins. And in that way, you're prepared for the kingdom's coming. The gospel writers all tell us that people flocked to John from all over the land. And here was the first prophet to appear among them in over 400 years. So they knew they had to go and listen to what was the latest that God had for them to hear. Even Jesus responded to this invitation. I think somehow in God's economy, this was the trigger event that moved him into his ministry. Before that time, Jesus had been simply the eldest son of the family. He, with Mary and Joseph, had kind of conducted the affairs of the, of the family. He had been commissioned as eldest son with all the responsibilities that went with being an elder son in the family. He had several brothers, and he had several sisters. But he learned that Joseph's trade as an artisan probably worked with wood and stone, at least. Uh, not a few miles away from Nazareth was the up-and-coming town of Sepphoris, and uh, it was being built, and a skilled workman was be were being called into service. I wouldn't be surprised if Joseph and Jesus and then Joseph, Jesus' brothers wouldn't have found their way there to day fill their days with work. As the other sons of Mary and Joseph grew older, they too entered into the work of their father. But when Jesus heard of John's work and message, he knew that now was the time, and he left the work of his family and went to John to be baptized of him. Jesus knew that here was the time he must be about his father's business. And here it is interesting that we get the impression that John was preaching and inviting people to be baptized for him, by him, for the forgiveness of their sins. John also had some other things to say. Um, and the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. And soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. I've often wondered about that because you know, Luke has remembered that for us and he has brought that detail to us. And it has occurred to me that he has done this because for Luke, as we see later in Acts, it's very important that the repentant children of God take on the responsibilities of maintaining the community of God that those people who are poor, they are taken care of within the community of faith, that those people who are, uh, what was the second group, the tax collectors, those who are involved in daily work, do not extort from others more than they should, and those that are soldiers who have authority are not to, uh, not to press for their advantage as, as people in authority. Um, of course, Luke tells us then in when the church was first founded in chapter 4 of Acts, that when the Spirit came upon them in one, one specific place in Acts 4, Luke tells us that the apostles were filled with grace to do miracles, and the people were filled with grace in that they brought, all the, brought excess monies into the congregation to be distributed, and his comment that he ends us with is saying, and there was not anyone who had that had lack. And I thought of anything that the church has forgotten in some respects, not all, of course, but in some respects, is that 
we have not taken these things seriously. I was raised as a part of a church that was very conservative, uh, prided themselves on uh, being people of the scripture. Uh, where the scriptures speak, we speak, and where the scriptures are silent, we are silent, so we said. And, uh, and, and it's a fine notion, but it wasn't true in that the church had a complete blind spot when it came to those people within their own congregations that were in need. When they had people within their congregations who were people of authority, and they abused their authority. And they just, you know, <laughs> it was just amazing to me as I grew up and I saw what was going on, I thought, I mean, it was such that my dad, much older than I, of course, decided he wasn't going to be any part of the congregation anymore. Uh, he saw it as a group of hypocrites. But, you know, you, you just have to work with what you are because, <laughs> you know, we all have points at which we're blind and need help. But this, uh, this material, and I think in the history of the church, the church has done so much good. I mean, how, much, how many organizations exist in Tucson that exist because of the church? Hospitals, feeding programs, programs to help the abused, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All because people were moved, I believe, by the Spirit of Christ. It didn't matter what church they were part of. They were moved by the Spirit of Christ to minister in Christ's name. But <laughs> we have allowed for uh, the systemic problems of poverty to exist without addressing them, oftentimes within our society. Um, and if we take the words of John that were preserved for us by Luke and the Spirit and then brought them across into the New Testament church that did the same thing we would have said, whoa, you know, there's something about the whole structure of the church that should reflect not the practice of the world, but the practice of Christ. And uh, it's, uh, it's always been a mystery to me. Of course, <laughs> I guess as one suspects, I've always been a mystery to me for some of the choices I've made when I should have known better. But that's, you know, that's part of our lives under Christ. And uh, thankfully, there's forgiveness for that. But in so many ways, um, this aspect of the Baptist teaching and invitation has been basically ignored, not really taken into t consideration. But he, John continued to speak of one who was, he was unworthy to do the act of a certain servant to loosen the shoes, the sandals off his feet. And I imagine one day he was busily at work preaching and then people lining up to be baptized in the, in the river. And suddenly he stopped short in the process and hesitated as a young man, Jesus, came before him. And John understood who he was even as we often understand, we just have this sense of who this is before us. And he said to Jesus, I need to be baptized by you. Why do you come to me? Jesus understood that he was, John understood that Jesus was the one of whom he had spoken and the one through whom the Spirit would come and through whom presence is in his presence, judgment would fall upon the people. That notion is finally is addressed only in the Gospel of Matthew, where Matthew says in his text, John Jesus responds, allow it to be done to fulfill all righteousness. And as I have pondered that phrase, and many people have, it seems to me that it makes the most sense to realize that Jesus lived under the notion of fulfilling all that God required at the time of his life. First thing that John, that Jesus knew God required of him was to obey the law. 
And so he responded to the law. And we find out in Luke, for example, he was in the synagogues on Sabbath day, such as was his custom. <laughs> and that was part of his life, even as part of ours, as people who honor him. But uh, the other aspect of fulfilling God's righteousness is not only doing the law, but it's doing what the prophet has said. This is the prophet John, the new revelation of God's will. And John says, you must be baptized. And we can say, well, he didn't have any sins to, to wash away. Well, that's probably true. But what was definitely true was that J that baptism for all people, including Jesus, marked a turn, a change in his life. From that for, time forth, Jesus would not be the same man. In the sense, he was not going back home and doing the work of Joseph or Mary. He was now about to do his father's business. Leaving his previous life behind, he war entered into the work of the ministry, for which reason we're here. For most of us who have been baptized and reflected on that and allowed its impact to touch our lives, the change is primarily the one of character and the one of choices that we make for our lives. With Jesus, we resolve to choose those practices and behaviors that reflect the word of God, that would bring honor to God. For those of us who have had responsible and honorable positions of working, it meant that those very positions and those areas of work would be filled with the dedication of God to do our best to seek to bring glory to God by the quality of our work and our joy in it. One guideline that has come to mean a lot to me and pro probably to many of you is from Paul in Colossians 3. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And you may remember that I have told the story that when that first impacted me, as far as what I was concerned to be its meaning, I was do doing janitor work in a private school in New England as I was preparing for ministry and taking work at Boston University and doing all these important things. But it hit me one day as I was doing this janitor work and cleaning out poison ivy from the fence lines and, and uh, mowing the, the polo grounds, etc. Instead of complaining about it, I should be thankful I'm doing it. That the Lord provided this for me. In fact, if I'm doing it for the glory of God, it becomes an occasion for a worshiping of God. I offer this up to God, and therefore, I offer up the best I can do where I am, as I am. And, you know, that was such a freeing experience. I'll, I, yeah, I'll just never forget it. And it's part of what, what I think Jesus intends for us is that as we enter into life as baptized persons, we enter into a new life of worship. All of life is now of worship in that we are offering to God our lives to seek to bring him honor, to seek to bring him grace. Um, anyway, that's, that's what it means, I think, for us as baptized persons there are those, of course, for whom their life needs to be altered because what they are doing are, are uh, practicing is, is our lives that are given over to things that are definitely sinful and those, that, those type of behaviors that bring discredit to the community and destroy life itself. Modern example would be the life of a man whose name is Christian Picchioni, 
He spent eight years as a violent supporter and recruiter for the white supremacist movement. But while participating in a violent attack on an African-American man one day, he experienced a moment of empathy for his victim, a moment that eventually led him to repent of his extreme racism and his hatred and to leave the white supremacist movement. And now he dedicates himself to teaching people caught up in that movement, leading them to give up the hate and prejudice and violence they preach. He also trains police officers and FBI agents in the beliefs of neo-Nazis and white supremacists. And one day he was interviewed by CBS International on his new life. The question was asked, do you fear for your safety? And he replied, well, I received death threats on a daily basis. But the way I look at it is I have spent eight years of my life doing something, being willing to die for something. <laughs> that was so wrong. Now I'm willing to die for something that is so right. And I'm trying to pull people out of that hate-filled movement. Otherwise, he said, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. For Jesus, it meant that he would no longer act as the eldest son and chief worker within the family. It was time for him to enter the path of service and sacrifice that was the way of the Messiah. God's call had come to him through the preaching of the Baptist, and having received that baptism, he was ready, empowered with the Holy Spirit, that would enable his work. In that way, we share with Jesus, not only in, in a sense, hearing the voice of God, you are my beloved child, <coughs> but receiving the Spirit, even as the scriptures say, he that repents and is baptized shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Receiving that gift, we are then set on the path of service to others. Jesus' ministry was multicultural, filled with compassion for women and children, definitely a new <laughs> within that society. He was filled with compassion on the outcast, the marginalized, the ill, the lame, the impure. Wherever he went, he allowed people to understand they were loved of God and they will be changed, even as the last day they will be changed. And for us, our baptism reminds us that we are to refocus on the needs of people around us, wherever those needs may be, and we seek to let all know that God is interested in them and would save them if they would turn life over to him. And we seek for our lives the evidence that we are Christians. There's an interesting story I came across the other day. It comes out of Brazil. A few years ago, a young man identified so completely with his home soccer team, <laughs> the Flamencos, that he covered his entire torso with a tattoo of the team's jersey. From his neck to his waist, he had tattooed the stripes of his favorite team. According to the report on this, it took 32 sessions with a tattoo artist and over 90 hours to complete the tattoo. He's even more radical than an Oakland Raider fan. <laughs> we may doubt the young man's sanity, but we cannot doubt his devotion to his team. How much money and time and pain was he willing to invest to show the world what he believed about his beloved soccer team? Our marks for the Christian life are not so evident. We may wear a cross, we may not. We may be involved in worship regularly, but when our lives become increasingly filled with compassion and prayers for others and generosity and worship and study and service, when these become the marks of our lives and the joy of our lives, then we know that the Spirit of God is moving within us to the glory of God. And like Jesus, 
we can identify with those around us and seek them for the kingdom of God. So Jesus' baptism provides a pattern for our own in the sense that we turn to God. Our lives are transformed to be offered to God on a daily basis in worship. We are forgiven and encountered by the Holy Spirit. And we have a whole new joy to our lives. The joy of the present spirit. The joy of being his for eternity. Amen. Our song at this time is number 161 in the Red Hymnal. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what Thou dost love, and do what Thou wouldst do. to bring to your attention the handout in the bulletin for the Don and Donna Mall concert that we'll be having next Sunday after church. It looks like this. They, they're a group from Tennessee that will be here with their instruments to perform. Oh, I guess I should do this. To perform with their uh, guitar, banjo, mandolin, dulcimers, um, and a host of other instruments. They'll be here for about an hour at 1 o'clock. And everybody is welcome. It is a free concert. We will take donations if you're up to that. But um, And you can go to their website, which is listed on here, uh, and listen to some of their music. It's very it's great music if you like uh, mountain type of music, which I found it very, very nice to listen to. They will be also selling instruments that they hand make, uh, dulcimers and um, luthers, zithers, a zither and so forth. Here, <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, but uh, they'll have those on display and they have CDs also. So everybody is welcome. Um, and so it'll be at one o'clock. We'll have both the church open and the hall open to, to listen. So come and enjoy it. I think you might. Thanks. Oh, my what they're doing is traveling in the United States doing this. In, in uh, this month, they're in. Arizona. This month they're in Arizona. Good choice. So, <laughs> yeah, they felt like they needed to get out of the snow in Tennessee, I think. So, anyway, looking forward to everybody being here, if you want to. Yes. Um, I'd like prayer for my brother-in-law. He was airbagged from uh, outside of Little Cuts to Become Heart Hospital. 
uh, it's had a quadruple bypass way many years ago, and uh, but he's having issues again. His name? John Harris. John. Thank you. Yes. Well, continued prayers. A couple of weeks ago, I think before Christmas, I asked for prayers for Charlie Clark. Yeah. Many of you might have known him here from, he was in a long time Methodist. He had back surgery, which was successful, but he has had a very hard time coping with the requirements of rehabilitation. And he fell down some stairs, he did not damage the back. He did stretch some muscles in his neck and ligaments. He's back in rehab. And I would pray for uh, his, um, I guess, awareness of what it takes at our age, I'm talking about me, uh, to rehabilitate after a big surgery. It's not easy. So prayers for, I guess, calmness on mm. his part. No. Patience. Patience, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Marty. Um, I wanted to bring attention to the aunt who has had a back surgery, who is having difficulty with pain. And, um, and Lord, pray for that girl. She doesn't know when to stop. Oh, and she needs to stop and rest and let her body heal. So I guess she needs calmness and spirit and patience. And patience. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. That won't teach you. I don't know what will. <laughs> <Twins>. Yes. <laughs> Regarding Leanne, uh, Thursday, uh, Ed and I received a phone call from her, and she was her old self. Oh. She, uh, the doctors had given her the right medication to take care of the pain, and she just sounded wonderful. So we want to thank the Lord, you know, that, that the physicians finally saw fit to give her the right uh, medication. Okay. Also, I'd like to raise up, because you know, Buzz, it seems yeah. like Buzz has gone from bad to worse. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Our prayers of uh, compassion and uh, Encouragement for the family of uh, Denver Augustus Brewer, whose death we remembered yesterday, the young man that I had baptized just three weeks ago, uh, passed away, and uh, we had the service yesterday, and just his family, uh, of course, the, the Irwins, who are grandparents and uh, the couple, uh, Joshua and Alyssa, um, they all need the good Lord's grace. I have something. I'd... Yes. I'd like to um, thank the congregation uh, for their thoughts and words of compassion for my mom who passed away. Um, she had told me earlier last year that she didn't think that she would see uh, 2022, so she waited until December 31st <laughs> to uh, at 11:11 to leave. And uh, what's funny uh, in the Bible, 11:11, the time is uh, it's called a master number, and it means a gathering of angels has happened at that time. Um, and so she went out with a, a great smile on her face, I think. Um, and we were, my brothers and I were there with her when she passed. But I do appreciate the prayers we've given her over the last few months since she was in hospice. And um, she was a great lady and I loved her dearly. But thank you so much for supporting me and her through these last times. So thank you very much. boy that for three weeks my sister was visiting and we had a wonderful reunion after two years mm -hmm. yes 
Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for the prayers and cards we received for our great grandson and the compassion of the church. And so thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. I want to thank everybody for your prayers for me last week when I fell apart, and for my friend Jenny who lost her daughter at age 19. They buried her this week. We're trying to trying to help her. Trying to help her. Thanks for your prayers. My and my grandson is grieving. There's no 19-year-old should have to grieve. Well, let us be praying together, please. Our gracious God, we come before thee ever thankful, ever thankful for your presence among us, for your care for us in Christ, for the spiritual blessings that you grant us that enable us to emerge from oftentimes the most extreme difficulties that life can bring to us. We pray for those named today. And uh, we pray for John, for your healing grace in his heart's condition. Pray for Charlie, for patience in recovering from his back surgery, as well as for Leanne. Um, these active people so often unwilling to wait for the healing to complete itself. Bless them in that. We pray for Jim and his family and his death of his mom. May your peace be upon the family. Thankful that Doug and his sister, his sister who has given so many years of care to the brother, thankful they were able to spend good time together. And we pray for Buzz. Pray that in some way you can break through his, his situation and bring him to an awareness. Bringing him to change, to find healing. And we pray your continued grace upon the family of the young woman who died and your grace upon Sarah's grandson who knew her and for all who are concerned and surround that family, grant them wisdom and grace. We pray for our nation and pray for its healing we pray for your people throughout this world that they will find strength. And we pray that in all things, your name will be upheld and held in honor by all. And now we share in that prayer Jesus taught us. And we say, Our Father, Two eighty four will be used in preparation for communion.
we focus afresh on the gift of Jesus Christ to us. This bread brings to our minds again his body, his suffering, his life of ministry, but at last, his giving of his life for us. And this fruit of the vine brings to mind the blood shed on the cross that we might find life. That night in which he was betrayed, we remember that he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And at the close of the meal, he took a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the remission of sins. Drink you all of it. So let us pray. Gracious God, for your gifts of life to us, we are thankful. For this table of remembrance, we are thankful. May it ever call to us a renewal within our hearts and minds of that covenant with Christ to serve and to honor. We pray for your strength as we partake of the bread of life, of your renewal within us as we partake of this fruit of the vine. Bless each one for your glory's sake we ask it. Amen.
And let us partake of the cup of salvation. Our closing song, number 389. Well, thanks for letting me back in. <laughs> it's always great to be back. Um, there are goodies next door, as usual. And uh, enjoy the fellowship and the food and, and all things uh, God's grace. Let's pray together. Thank you for your mercy, dear Father. Thank you for the joy we celebrate in you pray your blessing upon our fellowship. And may your grace ever be a wonder to us, and may your spirit ever keep us close to you. And may the love of Jesus ever inspire us as we seek to please you and worship you with our lives. And we pray through him, our Lord Jesus. Amen.